On February 2, 2008, 24 year old real estate agent Lynn C. Buziak went to a house viewing at a property in Victoria, British Columbia. The home was lavish and located in an exclusive cul de sac. A prospective couple had reached out to Lynn C., claiming to be looking for a million dollar home. Something about the interaction struck her as odd, but Lynn C. went through with the viewing. What's the worst that could happen? Lynn C. never made it out of that house alive. The whole thing had been a setup from the start. Lynn C. Elizabeth Buziak was born on November 2, 1983, to parents Evelyn and Jeff Buziak. She was one of two girls. Lynn C. had big ambitions for her career in real estate after finishing college. Her caring and personable nature made interactions with potential clients a pleasure. Lynn C.'s family described her as a popular girl. She was dating Jason Zalo at the time, who came from a prominent family that owned a successful real estate business. At the end of January 2008, Lynn C. received a call from a woman. She told Lynn C. that she and her husband were on the market for a home in the $1 million range and needed to find something urgently. The woman had a foreign accent and gave a name which turned out to be fake. Alarm bells went off for Lynn C. right away. A $1 million home was a big sale for a junior real estate agent, and Lynn C. didn't understand how the caller had gotten her number. She asked the woman that, and one of Lynn C.'s past clients had passed on her number. After the call had ended, Lynn C. spoke to her boyfriend and father about her concerns. Jason told her that she should take on the client due to the high commission she would get from the sale. Jason also eased her concerns further. He told Lynn C. that he would be outside on his car in case anything was off. Lynn C. was persuaded and started looking for a suitable home. When she found something that fit the brief, she booked an appointment with the client for a viewing on February 2, 2008, at 5.30 p.m. It was a Saturday and Lynn C. and Jason had lunch together before the viewing. They paid the bill of at 4.24 p.m. and left in separate vehicles. Authorities believe that Lynn C. went home first, before going to the viewing, so she could get changed. Jason went to a body shop to pick up a work colleague. He was behind schedule, and CCTV from the shop showed him and his colleague leaving at 5.30 p.m the same time that Lynn C. was due to start the viewing. Jason had been in touch with Lynn C. via several text messages, and she knew he was going to be late. The house was located in a small cul-de-sac of just four homes. It was number 1702, on the intersection of De Sousa Place and Torquay Drive. The woman had initially told Lynn C. that she would come alone. She arrived at the listing with a man presenting as her husband. The couple arrived on time, with two witnesses stating that they saw a six-foot-tall Caucasian man with dark hair and a blonde woman in a distinctively patterned dress walk up to the home. They were between 35 and 45 years old. The witnesses saw Lynn C. meet with the couple at the door of the home, shaking hands with both of them. The body language allegedly indicated that she didn't seem to know either of them. They then disappeared inside. This was the last time Lynn C. was seen alive. Jason and his colleague got to the home at roughly 5.40 p.m. As they drove up to the property, Jason saw a person through the glass of the front door. Jason initially parked outside the home. He stayed there for about 10 minutes before deciding to drive back to Torquay Drive and park there, avoiding being the nosy, interfering boyfriend. Another 10 minutes went by before Jason messaged Lynn C. to see if she was okay. Lynn C. never opened this message. Some more time passed, and since he had not heard back from Lynn C., Jason decided to check in. He went to the front door and found it was locked. He could see Lynn C.'s shoes through the glass, but saw no signs of any movement and his knocks on the door went unanswered. Jason then called 911. While he was speaking to the operator, Jason's colleague found a gap in the fence along the back garden. When he got through, he saw the back patio door was wide open. 
The colleague called to Jason, who told the operator they were going inside. He then hung up. The front door was unlocked by the colleague so that Jason could get inside. He ran upstairs and found Lynn C. lying in a pool of blood in the master bedroom. Another 911 call was made and emergency services were soon on scene. Unfortunately, there was nothing that they could do. Lynn C. was pronounced dead on scene. She had been killed after being stabbed multiple times. The lack of defense wounds indicated that it had been a surprise attack from behind. Nothing had been stolen, and Lynn C. had not been sexually assaulted. Both Jason and his work colleague were taken into police custody for questioning, but were both released without charge after their stories were checked out. The time-stamped surveillance footage from the body shop proved that they had not been in the house when the murder was committed. The Saanich police have interviewed Jason multiple times and state that he has always been cooperative and even passed a polygraph test. Authorities had little to go on when it comes to evidence. There was a distinct lack of DNA or fingerprints, which lead investigators to believe that the murder was carried out by a criminally sophisticated couple who perhaps had killed before. Investigators think that the couple had been about the exit the front door when Jason pulled up, hence him seeing the figure through the glass, and when his car was spotted, they instead left through the back of the property. The getaway vehicle was presumably parked somewhere along Torquay Drive. Investigators hoped that some leads would come after tracking down the number that had called Lindsay. The phone it came from had been purchased in Vancouver a few months before the murder. It wasn't used until the call to Lindsay was made and had been activated under the name Paula Rodriguez, which was fake. The phone had been registered to a real address in Vancouver, where a business was located, but there was no connection between this business and what happened to Lindsay. It seems the address was randomly chosen. Not long after the murder, the phone was deactivated. It has never been switched back on, and the investigators feel that it was purchased solely to use in the hit on Lindsay. Jason's family was investigated due to their connections to the area where the home was located. The developer, Joe D'Souza, was a friend and associate of Jason's mother, Shirley. Joe had been in the cul-de-sac an hour before the murder supervising a home that was still under construction. But after looking into any possible connections, police stated that they didn't believe anyone in the Zalo family was involved in what happened to Lindsay. Two detectives that worked on the case later revealed that about eight weeks before her murder, Lindsay tried to reach out to a friend of her ex-boyfriend while she was in Calgary. In January 2008, four weeks later, that friend was arrested in the largest drug bust in Alberta's history at the time. He was allegedly a major participant in a drug trafficking operation. But what does that have to do with Lynn C.'s death? Well, there has been speculation that Lynn C.'s murder may have been tied in with this drug trafficking. Not that she was involved, rather that she had been an informant. This has remained a theory despite detectives ruling out the possibility after confirming that Lynn C. had not worked as an informant. Seasoned detectives that have looked at the case believe that the crime was very personal in nature, and while she likely did not know the couple, someone close to her organized the murder. In late 2008, a close friend of Lynn C. claimed to have been woken up in the middle of the night after a phone call from an unknown number. She was half asleep and was not registering much of what the woman on the other end was saying. The friend did notice one thing, though. The woman had a foreign accent. Suddenly, the friend remembered Lynn C. mentioning that phone call from a lady with a foreign accent. This freaked her out, and she decided to call the number back repeatedly, as the call had already ended. After dialing the number between 20 and 20 times, someone finally answered. Who was on the other end? Shirley Zilo. That's right, Jason's mom. The friend was confused and asked Shirley how she had her number and why she was calling. Shirley replied that she had called the wrong number in her phone, as the friend shared a name with Shirley's secretary. She didn't know why her number was on her contact list and assumed Jason must have added it. While this event certainly is suspicious, 
Shirley categorically denies this event ever took place. It is unclear whether any follow-up on these claims were made. There is still hope that one day, Lynn C.'s case will be solved. In February 2021, Sonic's police announced that advances in DNA analysis had created new leads, and since the beginning of 2020, FBI investigators have also been working on the case. Lynn C.'s murder is truly bizarre. This was not a crime of passion. It was meticulously planned and set up. She didn't seem to know the individuals, and if that was indeed the case, who had hired them, and who were they? Had the couple murdered before, or have they gone on to murder other people in hired hits? Hopefully one day, we will know the truth, and those responsible will be brought to justice.